I'm Gordon Stewart, and this is Tales from Weird Scotland. The stories told in Tales from Weird Scotland relate to the supernatural and may detail dark and distressing events. For this reason, the podcasts are not recommended for listeners who may find such content upsetting. Shoes for Black Donald Of the devil, it is said. The one skill that he lacks is shoemaking. That's not to say he's not a fine dresser. If you were to meet him, and pray you do not, the first thing that would strike you is just how well dressed he is. No matter the occasion, he has a suit, a corset, a kilt to match it. But there are no earthly shoes which can cover his cloven hooves and it is by these that you can identify him. By these and by what he asks of you. In a small village, on a remote island, on the eve of the shortest day of the year, Angus Sutty, the village cobbler, was drawing his day's work to a close. The evening had just begun, but the sky had already been dark for many hours. Angus shuttered the windows and had just locked the door of his small workshop from the inside. He was about to put the key in his pocket when a voice spoke from behind him, startling him so that he dropped the key on the cold stone floor. The workshop had long been empty save for himself, and yet, somehow, someone was addressing him from within the room. Angus, is it? He turned, and there, standing behind his workbench, was a tall stranger dressed in fine evening wear. He had deep red hair and a large auburn beard. His face was not unpleasant, with high cheekbones and a thin nose which turned up slightly at the end. His eyes, though, told a story the rest of his face couldn't quite keep up with. They pierced Angus in a way that made him feel small and alone, and their colours seemed to constantly shift, but never quite to match. Oh, you scared me! exclaimed Angus. I've no much to take if it's money you're after. Though, as soon as he said this, he was struck by the absurdity of the idea. A finely dressed man such as this, robbing him, a poor widowed cobbler. How'd you get in here? He asked, trying to keep the tremor from his voice. Oh, pay that no mind. I'll always find a way in. No, Angus. I've a favour to ask you. See, you've a talent which I lack. You're a cobbler. And as you can see, I am in desperate need of a pair of shoes. The stranger stepped out from behind the workbench. Angus froze. Barefoot is a word which didn't quite tally with what he saw. From the ends of the stranger's trouser legs, there emanated thick, coarse, black hair that flowed to the floor, and through which showed, unmistakably, a pair of cloven hooves. The colour drained from Angus's face, and his breath caught in his throat. It's no you. Just call me Black Donald, Angus. May folk find it easier. And I, cross yourself if it brings you comfort. But as I say, I'm here on business. Shoes, Angus. Let's talk shoes. As you can see, I'm all made up for a ball. But I can hardly go charming the pants off all the fine lads and lasses in these great clutes. Black Donald beamed at Angus and danced a quick two-step to demonstrate 
scoring deep, fiery grooves into the flagstone floor as he did. Now, Angus, something tells me what I'm needing, you're the man for making. So here's the deal. Distracted, Black Donald paused for a moment. <laughs> deal! Get it! Just like me! <laughs> Anywho, you make the shoes. Shoes which will hide these old paws and make me look dashing to boot. And in exchange, you'll get whatever it is you fancy. If there's something your life's been missing, or someone, just name it. And it's yours, my man, forever and thereafter. So long as I'm happy with the work, mind. Angus stared, slack-jawed and pale. But why me? Black Donald's face turned suddenly grave, and the darkness in the room seemed to deepen with it. Put it this way, son. I've asked for your service, and you will oblige me. You will make my shoes, and you will make them as well as anything you've ever made. And then you will sign your name in my book. As he said these words, an open book bound in something close to leather seemed to weave from the darkness into Black Donald's hands for a moment. Rows of names written in something close to ink, visible on the ancient pages. A moment later, the book drifted back into the swollen darkness. Black Donald's eyes gleamed with a menacing oddness, each orb seeming to stray further in likeness from its twin as the darkness in the room bloomed around them. There was a moment where Angus thought the gathering darkness would swallow them both. But then the smile returned to Black Donald's face and the darkness bled back into its natural spaces. Now, measure me up and we'll have no more of this silliness. Fear of damnation is a powerful thing, but the fear of angering Black Donald was, in truth, just as terrifying a prospect. And there was another side to all of this. It had been twenty years now since he'd lost his dear Morag, twenty years of an unnatural quiet in their house. Twenty years of uncomfortable glances from friend and neighbour, of speculation and rumour about who had really been to blame for the accident. And here, almost beyond belief, was a chance to change that terrible day, to reclaim those wasted years spent in the cold absence of the one he loved most. There was, of course, the matter of signing his name in that dreadful book, and all that would entail. But the agony, the guilt, the aching loneliness. How many thousands of days had Angus wished he could prevent the unpreventable and have his morag back? All of them every single day since she passed. What had life been since that day but hell itself? And so Angus began to work. He'd spent his whole working life making shoes for every different size and shape of foot, but at the end of the day they had all been feet. Here he was having to improvise. His hands shook as he measured the great black hooves, and he shuddered when he accidentally brushed the coarse hair of Black Donald's legs. Mercifully, the professional part of his brain soon took over, and in some small way he actually found himself enjoying the challenge. Although that did not stop his stomach twisting into knots whenever he had to lean in close and breathe in the unmistakable smell of soot 
and sulphur. Before too long, Angus had all the notes and measurements he would need, and had even produced several sketches which Black Donald, wide-eyed, approved of heartily. Great stuff, my man. Just great. I knew you were the man for me. Now, I've got to scram. Lots of things on the boil, but I'll be back for these the morrow night, at the darkest hour. I've an engagement, you see, for which I'm very keen to be both suited and booted, if you catch my meaning. Anywho, I'm sure that'll be plenty of time. And once I've got my boots, you shall get your wish. No need to say your name. It's written on your face like a storm on a wheat field. With that, Black Donald stepped away from the workbench and, winking, chuckled. Don't worry. I'll see myself out. And just like that, Angus was alone. Silence and the task ahead closed in around him. He worked long into the night, and finally, when the first shoe had taken shape, he sat back and looked at it properly for the first time. The object disgusted him. On paper, it had been enough removed from reality that he could think about it in the abstract, but once it had form, the obscenity of the thing the negative space it enclosed and the thought of what would fill that space burned the back of his throat with bile. He could work no more tonight. His back ached and his eyes stung with tiredness. The boot's vile twin would have to wait till tomorrow. Angus rose from the workbench and headed through the door that adjoined his shop with his cottage. He collapsed on his bed and fell almost at once into a deep and exhausted sleep. He often dreamed of Morag. Sometimes it was visions of the accident, the look in her face, the light fading from her eyes, and sometimes it was just of her, her smell, her embrace, the ring of her voice in his ears, her breath on his cheek. This was one such night. He felt her fold around him gently, felt her stroke his aching shoulders. She sighed. Hi, you always were a fool, Angus. I just want you back to be forgiven. There's nothing to forgive, except to forgive yourself. He felt something loosen in his heart, a terrible knot beginning to shift. You can't do this, Angus. Think what he'd do if he could move among us, unseen for what he truly is. There's death and there's damnation, but this... You'd be opening the door for him. But we'd be together. There's no way back, love. I am where I am. Whatever he does, whatever he brings, it won't be me. And when the time comes, you wouldn't be able to join me. You'd be his. He felt her kiss, and then... He felt her go. When Angus woke, the dim winter light showing through the crack in the curtain told of late morning. He'd usually have risen hours earlier, but last night's exertions had taken their toll. He sat up and peered from the small window, looking out at the weak sun filtering over the bare fields around the village. He knew she was right. What to do then? The first thing, of course, was to stoke the fire in the workshop. Angus got up, still trailing strands of warmth and comfort from the dream. He went back through to the workshop, 
and it was still there. The boot. His stomach lurched at the sight of it. He built the fire using his sketches and notes to catch the kindling, and then he set about undoing what he had done the night before. He prized the stitches apart and shredded the leather into scraps, and once the terrible boot had been completely deconstructed, Angus threw the scraps onto the fire to wither and burn. For a time he just sat watching the leather scorch and squirm. He spoke to the dying fire. If this was your last day, what would you do with it? What would you want to see? He would visit Morag's grave, he decided, and then he would make the trip to visit his mother's old croft on the north of the island, the place he'd been born. It was years since he'd been up there. He'd spend the longest night there and hope Black Donald wouldn't find him. Slim chance of that, he thought, but at the very least he could end his journey where he started it as his mother had done also. There was some comfort in that thought. Angus left his cottage, locking the door behind him. The wind whistled cold around the low houses of the village, unwelcome but not unbearable. He took the road which led to the kirkyard, winding past open fields, out onto a squat hill overlooking the sea. Her headstone stood in the lee of the kirkyard wall, out of the worst of the wind. He touched the smooth stone and sighed. You're right, of course. Always were. I guess I'll see you soon, love. He left soon after and continued down the hill and along the coast road. The village was soon lost behind him. As he walked, Angus felt as though he was seeing much of the land around him for the first time, even though he'd known it his whole life. It's easy, he thought, to know something so well that you almost stop seeing it entirely. That struck him as a great pity. All around him, the sea, the land, the wild air had the feeling of becoming fleeting. Almost as if, if he closed his eyes, they would disappear entirely. But with a pang of longing so desperate that it almost made him sob, he realised that it was he that was fleeting. If he were to live one more day or a thousand, the sea, the land, the air would persist long beyond his time. He longed to be somehow kept by it, to become a part of it all, to be a rock worn by wind and tide, to last, though nothing really lasted. It was well into the afternoon by the time Angus arrived at his mother's old cottage. She had lived here and farmed the land until she could no longer sustain it. Although the house had stayed in the family when she died, no one else had taken it on and so it had fallen into disrepair, as was becoming increasingly common on the island. The population slowly dwindling as more young folk moved to the mainland looking for work and the older generations slowly expired. The wind and rain had had their way with the place, but it still stood, decrepit yet defiant, as she had been in her final years. It was a long, squat stone building with a mouldering thatch roof, which time and weather had worked hard to weaken. There had once been a chimney at either end of the house, but only one continued to stand vigil against the skyline, 
The other was now just a pile of rubble. A little way off from the house, a deep stone well stood grim and silent. The land around the house had been slowly invaded by gorse and wild grasses, or reclaimed by them, he thought, as he pushed against the solitary door and the accumulation of sand that had built up inside the doorway. Inside the house, Angus saw that the elements had continued their reclamation. Seaweed and other organic debris strewn the floor, and what scant furniture there was had been overturned by inquisitive winds. It took him an hour or so to make the place habitable, if not homely. Of the two chairs in the house, one was still sturdy enough to support his weight, the other he turned into kindling. He found that not only was the remaining chimney intact, but, incredibly, it was unblocked too. So he started a small fire and continued to clean the house. The longer he spent pushing back nature's incursions, the guiltier he felt about having allowed this place to go to seed. He almost felt reproach from the house itself as if the rattling shutters were recriminations from the spirit of his mother, still stubbornly holding on to the house that she had been born in and died in, demanding to know why he had allowed it to fall into such disrepair. Eventually, Angus felt a truce was reached. The floor was clear, the wind had died down and warmth had returned, to one of the hearths. He felt grudging acceptance from the house, and so he dared sit for a while, having paid his tribute to the place. Tired from his efforts, he drew up the remaining chair near the fire. He had not intended to fall asleep. In a way, it had been a nice thing, He felt warm and cosy and had drifted off in a stream of memories of the years he spent there. He dreamed of his mother and happier times, the day he'd first introduced her to Morag. However, when he awoke the fire was low and the room was dark. He winced in regret, suddenly wishing that he'd made a better effort at running or even just finished making those damned shoes. But he consoled himself that he had made his choice and he had stuck with it. Angus rose and crossed the room to the door, thinking of looking for some driftwood with which to stoke the fire. Going somewhere, are we? Black Donald spoke from the chair by the fire, as if he had sat there the whole evening. Terror dripped down Angus's spine and rooted him to the spot. You know, Angus, it's a funny thing. I've stopped by your wee shop a minute ago, and it was empty as a church on the finest day of summer. Where's that Angus got to, I says to myself. And there's the point. Where's my boots? Angus could only make out Black Donald's silhouette. And then I looked in the fireplace. Black Donald rose in a movement so silent and swift that it took Angus's mind a moment to register it happening. In that moment, Black Donald closed the distance between them. Speak, man. Tell me why there is scorched leather in your fireplace. Tell me why I find you here cowering in this crumbling hovel. Did you really think you could get away from me? Black Donald radiated malice. Each breath he took seemed to suck all warmth from the air, and each exhalation was like a blast of furnace heat on his face. Suddenly Black Donald's rage subsided. His voice was almost forlorn when he spoke. You've cheated me, Angus. Cheated me of my boots and cheated me of your name in my book. He stepped back from Angus and looked at him, his eyes shifting and dancing in the ember light. I'll no be left empty-handed. If I can't have your soul, your skin will do just fine. But as I'm a sporting man, I'll give you 
one final roll of the dice, as it were. The darkness in the room deepened, as it had done the previous evening in his workshop. Black Donald's figure grew and twisted, mesmerising Angus like some snake preparing to devour him. In a voice as old and vast as the shores of Tartarus, Black Donald intoned, The fire is low and the well is deep. The thing you choose is the thing you'll keep. As he spoke these words, one of Black Donald's eyes smouldered like a burning ember, while the other glinted cold and dark like the moon on the sea. In each eye, Angus saw his fates unfold. Hell with this! shouted Angus, making a desperate rush for the door. He expected the darkness gathered around them to wrap him in inky bonds and smother him in an instant, but it did not. He made it past the door of the house and out onto the freezing midwinter air. For a moment, Angus thought he was free. Help me this indeed. Leave the choice to me and I shall gladly choose. Both it is. Something stirred in the fireplace. Embers shifted, then were thrown across the room as great burning chains flew from the hearth. They scorched the floor as they snaked across it with tremendous speed and shot out of the house, lighting on fire everything they touched as they did. Before he could even turn to see, the chains were upon him, binding and searing Angus where they touched him. He was wrenched to the floor and dragged, limp and screaming, to the old stone well that stood by the house. Black Donald stepped out from the house, which had now caught fire too. He watched as Angus was dragged over the low stone lip and down into the old well by the infernal chains which bound him. The water hissed and thrashed. The light glinted off Black Donald's eyes and his still uncovered hooves. Within a minute, Angus Sutty had burned and drowned, but his name was still his own, and wherever he passed on to, his dying wish was that Morag would be waiting for him. In the light of the slowly growing blaze, Black Donald looked thoughtful, almost melancholy. He produced a flask from his pocket, which he always kept filled with his own special reserve. Raising it in the direction of the well, he drank a silent toast to the memory of poor Angus, then continued on his way, shoeless for a time. That was Shoes for Black Donald, a tale written by me, Nick Cole Hamilton. The tale was told by Gordon Stewart and featured Donald Cowan as Black Donald, Barbara Buchanan as Morag, and me as poor old Angus. This episode was recorded, produced, and radiophonically designed by me, Nick Cole Hamilton, with script help from Sylvia Gomez Benitez, Saran Walker, and Robert Swift. This is the second of our Dark Tales for the Dark Season. We hope you've been enjoying this new and slightly different format. We have some more interesting and different things lined up for the new year, but we'll also be returning to our more regular format in due course. If you're interested in what we're doing, or you're just keen for more weirdness, why not follow us on Twitter? We are at Tales Weird. Weird spelled W-Y-R-D. All that remains is to wish you a very fine solstice. Stay warm, stay weird, and stay safe. And when the time comes, lang may your lum reek. This is a You Better Run Media production. Join us again soon for more Tales from Weird Scotland. <laughs>